In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our dear Master and our dear Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, we thank you for your kindness, your mercy, your blessings, your calling unto us, your reaching out to us, your drawing us closer to you. I thank you, dear Lord, for revealing yourself to us in your house and in your words. And in this meeting, I pray, dear Lord, that you would show us the path, dear Lord, into the kingdom of heaven. I pray, dear Lord, that you would lead us as we always pray, I pray, dear Lord, that you would embrace us and hold us, not only us, our kids, our families, those all around the world, dear Lord. We pray for all your children in all places. We ask for your mercy, your blessings, and your spirit to work in us. The intercession of St. Mary, Archangels Michael and Gabriel, and the witnesses of the Holy Transfiguration, hear us when we, your children, cry unto you with one voice, saying, Our Father, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, everyone, uh, try and grab a seat. We're about to get started. I used to have this thing at St. John Church. Whenever we started, there would be no one. Then we'd start and pray, and by the time the prayer was done, God would just bring the people. See, it happens here too, so it's, it's, a, it, it's a real thing. So we're going to continue our series on the treasures of orthodoxy. I hope that you are beginning to expand your understanding of the church. <clears throat> we said that the jewel of orthodoxy is nothing other than Jesus Christ himself. And that is why our lives are centered around Jesus Christ. Our calendar is centered around Jesus Christ so that our lives are merged together, that we can be united with him, which I think is quite unique. But this week... I wanted to give you something a little different. I wanted to give you some of the characteristics of Orthodox spirituality. This is not going to be an exhaustive list, and I'm going to be doing a disservice. There's no way I can talk about all the characteristics of Orthodoxy in a few moments, and we might have to do it over several weeks, but I just want to give us some idea of the foundations of what it means to to kind of have an orthodox type spiritual life. And by the way, I understand there are revelations of the gospel to other denominations, and I'm not dying the truth in other churches. I'm trying to give a perspective on the orthodox spirituality that has been handed down to us. Now again, I'm talking about the characteristics of orthodox spirituality, and I have a confession. I am not... A spiritual giant. I have my own faults and weaknesses and shortcomings. I'm not the authority on Orthodox spirituality. I apologize. But some of the stuff I have been introduced to in the church and through my readings, I just wanted to share. And like I said, for me to limit them to a few, I had about 10 written down, and I'm only going to get through three. I apologize. Now, why am I even talking about this? We spoke a little bit about the goal of Christianity last week. What is the goal of Christianity? To what? To be united with Christ and the imitation of Christ. Like, those are your goal. The methods that we're going to discuss, to me, are important because it's a tried and true path for almost two thousand years people have been going on this path there's an abundance of saints that are being created and spiritual giants when i tell you the levels of spirituality they reached you're going to be like i didn't even know that that was possible H how is that possible and what's interesting is that when i talk to people from other churches they're like i've never heard of this i'm like i know where i'm going to tell you something it might sound weird but like it's kind of it happens in our church. It's kind of calm, and this is, this is what we have. I'm going to tell you one small story. 
It's, it's Ava Lot. He's just one of the fathers. He went to see his father, Ava Joseph. And he's like a good monk. He says, Ava, as far as I can say my little office, which is mean like his spiritual rule, I fast a little, I pray and meditate, I live in peace as far as I can, and I try to pure my thoughts. He says, what else can I do? So the old man stood up. He stretched out his hands towards heaven. His fingers became like ten lamps of fire. And he said to him, if you will, you can be all flame. He stood up and he was like, your hands could be like fire. Not, not that he's saying like, try to be like this, but I'm saying like, you're just beginning. The levels are so far that you cannot say you're there. Have you heard of the Anchorites, the Suah in Arabic? I'm sure you have. Some of you have, some of you haven't. But they're the spirit born. They're the ones that can go from here to there in moments. Saint Shenouda, uh in the 5th century, he traveled to the council from Egypt on a cloud. Like it just a cloud just just took him. He in his story, when you read his story, he was praying in the wilderness and then a ladder came down from heaven. He climbed the ladder. He saw a liturgy in heaven. He came down with like a golden orban. Sorry, ours is made of dough, but like, you're like, what? People are going to heaven and seeing the liturgy. You're like, where is this coming from? I'm like, this is the path that we've been given. And many of us are saying, I want to go on another path. I'm like, you can choose the path you want, but I can tell you that this path has created tons of saints. We have the saints that have returned to the level of Adam before the fall. What was Adam like in the fall before the fall? He was in paradise in harmony with the animals. We hear stories of so many saints where yeah, they just lived with the lions and the tigers and the one that Amabarsum who had like the big snake in his cell. Like, like there's this level of spirituality where it's like, it's intriguing. This is a path that I would like to, to pursue. Now, I'll be honest. I'm not saying that these are your goals that you start to go live with lions and you start to turn into fire and you start to be able to move from here to there. That's not your goal. But that wasn't their goal either. They weren't trying to accomplish those things. There are those who had in their mind to be martyrs, and they became martyrs. But to try to become a sawah, or all those things, those like, you never achieve it, because you're only pursuing pride. And so they know that it would never happen that way, but all I'm saying is there's a lot of people today that are against religion, but they're very into spirituality. I don't know if you've heard that, but I've, I've met a lot of people that say, you know, I, I'm like a really spiritual person. I don't know what that means. You know, he's like, when I'm playing my guitar, like, I really feel something. I said, that's great. What happens when you put the guitar down? Like, is God gone? Like, is it the guitar? Or So anyway, there's all types of spirituality. There's things that are new, that are trendy, that people are following, that sound fun, and it seems like a new way that might be awesome. One of the things that we do in our church is that we don't follow someone because they started well. We follow someone because they ended well. So we look at someone who was faithful until death because, I don't know if you've heard recently, there's all kinds of popular songwriters who are leaving the faith, writing like the world's most popular worship songs, leaving the faith. People who wrote like amazing books like I Kissed Dating Goodbye, which many of us grew up on, he left the faith. Like people who are like supposedly leading and doing great things, but then they left. So had you followed them, you might follow them also away. So we tend to look at the lives of people who have completed a faithful journey and their journeys have been a light to many others. I've mentioned this to you before. There's a book called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. Have you heard of it? The Ladder of Divine Ascent. It's actually one of the most famous Christian books in all of history. It's read in monasteries all over the world, especially during Lent. Monks read it. It's actually 
written by a monk who surveyed monks in Syria and Egypt centuries ago. And it's not exactly for the layperson. There is one that was made for the layperson, but the whole idea is this. It's called the ladder of divine ascent, meaning to go from level to level, there is a path. After seeing all the monks and talking to the spiritual giants, he says, I've come to realize that if you want to go up, you have to start from here. And then if you want to move from here, this is the next step and this is the next step. And it's 30 steps. The highest level is, you don't know? It's, it's, it's love, which is being like God, united to God. Now, 30 steps seems like, okay, I, I can do this. But like really, that last step really has no end. And how high you can go, there's no limit. But the idea is that there is a path and a, almost like a, a program kind of. That if we were to go in this path, a lot of us are trying to do our own thing. And it's not always working for us. For many of us, Oh, what I want to say is this. As the, the saints go up the path, they never get to the point where they say, oh, I am spiritual enough. I have arrived. I am there. There's no need for me to go further. I'm going to just enjoy this. It doesn't happen among them. They continue. The closer they are to Christ, the more they see there is more to go. So there is a, I was listening to a sermon by the late Father Antonio Hanin, who was an amazing, wonderful father, loved him to death. And he was talking about St. Macarius. You've heard of St. Macarius, we mention him in the liturgy every, you know, during the Megma. Um, he is one of the leaders of spirituality in the Orthodoxy. Like, he's like up there. His sayings are everywhere, like he's just phenomenal. His stories, he lived, this, the devils used to be afraid of him. They said, you defeat us all the time. He's like, we fast like you. We stay up like you. We don't have possessions like you. But he said, but then the devils told him, but you always defeat us. And he says, how? He says, they said, by your humility. Like the devils are like, you just defeat us. So he's, he's kind of up there. So uh, Abun Antonio, Antonio was telling us this story, which, which I've heard before, and I think it's, it's pretty cool. So St. Macarius, the leader of thousands of monks, was going to some monks, and he was going to talk to them. And the way he began was, Maggie remembers this, I am not a monk, but I have seen monks. And we're like, what? You are not a monk? You the leader of us all? How could you? He's like, God gave me this thought, and I tried to fight it for five years. But then I finally obeyed. God took me to the deep wilderness, and while I was there, I saw a water hole. I saw the animals drinking from the water hole. And as I looked closely, I found among the water hole, there were two men. I really had to look close and like, they were like angels. They were living among the wild animals, drinking with them. They, they didn't have clothes, like God gave them hair, an abundance of hair to protect them from the sun and the cold. And he gave them the food they need. They hadn't seen another person in 20 years. And... St. Macarius was like, how did you guys do this, you know? And so they told him, and St. Macarius, the giant, said, uh, I can't do that. And they said, then go back to your cell and, and repent. So St. Macarius, who's like way up there, like, you're, like if I could ever become like a thousand levels below St. Macarius, I think that'd be enough. But even St. Macarius says, and then God showed me, that there's even more. So what I want you to realize is that we're not allowed to settle. It's not okay to be where you are. You and I, we all need to grow and get closer and closer and closer. And so that's kind of what I want us to understand. After listening to these people, I feel as though I haven't even begun. So then how does one begin? In the spiritual life, one of the most important things in the spiritual life, and if you get one thing out of today, this is where you begin. You find a trusted spiritual 
guide. That's one of the most critical things you could do. All the saints had spiritual guides, all of them, to go further. When I was in high school, I got hold of some of these books of monks, and I loved them, and I started to imitate them when I was in high school, which was bad. And I thought I was doing great, but then a trusted spiritual guide, a very dear person to me, he said, Mark, what you're doing is all wrong. I was like, what do you mean? This is like the saints. He's like, Mark, you're trying to copy them. You're trying to leap to where they're at after it took them tens of years, and you're trying to get there in a few weeks. And I would have never thought, I'm like, I'm reading spiritual books. I'm following the saints. And it was a spiritual guide who humbled me. And he was right. I was getting nowhere. I was losing a lot of weight. But... I was not really drawing closer to God. I was becoming proud and following the form, but I wasn't following the essence of what got them there. And so when someone goes on the spiritual path on their own, you can easily be misled. And what was I doing? I was reading the lives of holy people trying to be like them. What is required is a spiritual guide. In a book I have, St. John of Damascene, He wrote this. He says, I suffered greatly from inexperienced advisors, from inexperienced spiritual guides. He says, I suffered greatly. He says, a guide should be free of passions, have good judgment, know how to begin, how to proceed. What is the structure of man? His strength, his knowledge, his weakness, his maturity. What is God's purpose and the meaning of each divine saying? It's like, well, that probably would be a good guide. But when you think about who we go to for advice, we're probably nowhere near that. But it is critical for us to find someone that can take us step by step. There's very much written about this. You can find whole books on spiritual guides. But you want to find someone, now granted you may not go find a monk in the desert who will be your spiritual guide, but someone who has gone down the path, who has already accomplished much in the spiritual life, has learned how to fall, has learned how to rise. They're not guiding others out of necessity, saying, okay, who wants to follow me? But people seem to seek them because of what has been seen in them. It's someone who is a person of prayer, who knows the Bible according to the spiritual understanding of the church, And it's actually someone who has been led by their own spiritual guides. Like not someone who just came down from heaven and I'll tell you how to get there. It's it's kind of been passed down from generation to generation, from father to disciple, from disciple who becomes a father or mother. I'm just using the male, but it's that's how it's done. And I wonder how many of us really have a true spiritual guide that sees, okay, your level is like this. What do we need to do? How do we tweak it? Just like when you go to a doctor, they're trying to assess your whole health and say, listen, this one part is what's preventing you from being healthy. So we need to tweak this. So it's someone that you trust, that you're able to open your heart up all your thoughts, all your bad deeds, someone that you can just say, these are my problems, and I want to grow. I could tell them, you know, I can go to my doctor and say, hey, I can run a mile in eight minutes, and I can do 30 push-ups, but I get chest pain. If I leave the chest pain part out, he's like, oh, you can do that, it's great. But if you don't tell them about the chest pain, every time you do the push-ups in the mile, guess what happens? He's going to not heal that part to be united with Christ we all need healing in every part of our lives this is not an easy thing and it's not always to find someone but most of us start with our confession fathers they're great they've gotten to where they are through experience and they will lead you and the spiritual guide can be your confession father most of the time it is and we trust them but it can be someone in addition to. But don't just go to someone who contradicts your confession father. That's not appropriate. Your confession father, 
can lead you to them or say, okay, this person can take you further, whatever. But start with your confession, Father, but it has to be someone you are attached to, trust, and are open with. You will find progress in your life if you begin there. If you become your own guide, you know what happens. If you become your own guide, you can't go far. You will lead to pride. You will say, I have the best Bible meditations. When I pray, oh, I feel great. And I really don't need to ask other people's opinions. I, I'm going to do it on my own. It doesn't go far. It doesn't. So one of the first things, once you find a spiritual guide, something that's critical to the spiritual life is a spiritual rule. A spiritual rule. How many of us have a spiritual rule? You're like, what is a spiritual rule? It's when your spiritual guide says, every single day, I need you to do this. And it might be very basic. They say, I want you to read one paragraph in the Bible, and I want you to say the Our Father three times. Or they might say, I want you to pray the Igbe in the morning and in the evening. But no matter what, that's your foundation. You do that every day, and you never go beneath that. You do it so that you can do it in your sleep, but while you're awake. Like, don't do it in your sleep. Like, be awake while you're doing the spiritual things. But it needs to become automatic. So then once you've conquered something, then they can advance you. The problem is when we don't have a spiritual rule, sometimes we read like five chapters in the Bible. And the next day, we may not read any. And then we go down. And we're going up and down. And there's no consistency. One of the most important things in your spiritual life is consistency. I had a father of confession tell me one time, he says, if one night you, for, you become lazy or you forget to pray or whatever, and Satan takes that night away from you, he says in the morning, snatch it back. Don't let too many days go because consistency is one of the most important things. So a spiritual rule is critical, and most of us don't have an absolute must. I have to. I can't close my eyes tonight. I, this is my schedule. I have to do this today. If you get into the habit of, I will not go below this, you're probably already higher than where you are. Many of us will probably go days or, you know, sometimes weeks where we're like, we're in a lull and we're not doing anything. You need to have a spiritual rule. And it can include fasting so much. And not just like, okay, fast Wednesday and Friday, but they might say, I want you to fast until 12 p.m. or 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. on Wednesdays and Fridays. During Lent, they're the ones that tell you how much to fast. Abuna Loa was wonderful. You know Abuna Loa from Torrance? Amazing man. And he was telling us one time, when he was in college, Abu Nimishoy Kamel was his spiritual father. And he was like, it was Lent, and Abu Nimishoy Kamel asked him, how much are you fasting to? And Abu Nimishoy, I don't remember his name, but he's like, till like 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., like almost till sunset. And Abu Nimishoy Kamel said, no, 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 that's for the saints. I want you to fast till 10 a.m. And he was like, what? Because Abu Nimishoy knew that he had Pride. He was fasting that late, and building pride. And so Abuna Mishoy humbled him and set him back early. And Abuna Loa tells us that story because it was wisdom. Having the spiritual guide, giving you the spiritual rule that is appropriate for you. If you are successful in the rule, they may advance it. If you're unsuccessful in the rule, they may change it and ease it up. Or if you're unsuccessful, they may find out Satan is tricking you. Satan is trying to defeat you in this. We need to do this rule. So let's tweak it. That comes with a close relationship and a spiritual rule. So we're starting basic. Find someone that can guide you and tell them, how do I begin? What should I do? And if they say after a month or two months, then we change it, you'll find progress. But without it, many of us will look at ourselves today and where we were 10 years ago or 20 years ago and find we're either the same or maybe even further back. There's an accountability when you have a spiritual guide as well and, and a confession father. 
Last thing I'm going to talk about. This is very inherent in everything we do in the Orthodox Church. The spirit of humility and self-denial. We cannot talk about it enough. And it is the most essential thing in the spiritual life. They say love is the highest of all virtues, but humility is the mother of all virtues. If you don't have humility, any virtue you have could disappear. St. Macarius, he seems to meet a lot of cool people. He's telling his monks, I knew a man who saw visions of heaven for six years, which is kind of cool. For six years he was having these visions, and he says, and I tell you even now weeping that even he has fallen. Why did he fall? It was because of pride. So someone can go to as high as seeing visions of heaven, but the pride could make you fall as low as possible. I don't know how much effort we make in pursuing self-denial. Jesus Christ said, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be a follower of mine, what do you have to do? Deny yourself. Carry your cross and follow me. He said, you'll never carry a cross and you'll never follow me if you never deny yourself. People who don't deny themselves are terrible followers. People who don't deny themselves try to be leaders. I'm not saying that your calling is not a leader. You can still be self-denial, but still lead others. A lot of our fathers do it, and that's what they have done. But self-denial is the absolute critical part. The reason why we say, Lord, have mercy in every liturgy. It's not just for the sinners in the stands. It's for the priest, the bishop, the pope, the saints. Everyone says, Lord, have mercy over and over. The Jesus prayer is, the, is what? Please tell me you can recite it by now. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Everybody, all these giants, they're all saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you look at the two stories, or Christ gave one parable, there was a man who was fasting twice a week. He was tithing. He was going to the synagogue and praying. And he thanked God that you made me such a good man, not like that tax collector. Who am I talking about? the Pharisee, who was doing the things, but because of his pride, Christ said, don't look at that guy. Look at that guy. What guy? The guy that's on his knees, hitting his chest, saying, Lord, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Christ praised the humble person. What does the Bible tell us? The Lord draws near to the humble, but the proud he knows from afar. It's not in one place. It's over and over. God draws near to the humble. But the proud, try. Try to pray and have all your prayers heard. The proud person tends not to be obedient to God or spiritual guides. The proud person isn't looking for help from a spiritual guide or someone else. The proud person feels like they can do everything on their own. The proud person looks at their accomplishments but doesn't look at their sins and weaknesses. If I only look at my good and never see my weaknesses, I will never be totally healed. Whereas the humble person, the fathers say this, in the spiritual life, spiritual struggle is absolutely required. But God doesn't give success in the spiritual life according to your struggle. He gives success according to your humility. God gives grace according to your humility. And if you look at it, St. Paul, who saw visions of heaven, who had done everything, in order for him not to be proud, it said he was buffeted, like he had a thorn in the flesh and he was begging God, and God said, I need you to be in weakness so you could have my strength. My grace will be more than enough for you. And most of us are 
doing the type of worship that may not be full of humility and I'm not worthy and I need you. Please have mercy on me. Please cleanse me. Please purify me. Please make me whole. It's more like, I thank you. Everything's so good. You're wonderful. And I have this and I have this. And it's completely opposite. If we compare our prayers to the prayer of the Pharisee and the Pharisee, the tax collector, let's look and see which one are we closer to. The one that was accepted or the one that was rejected. The self-denial is tremendous when it comes to relationships. There are times where a couple might have a difference in opinion. It happens, I've heard. Sometimes emotions get involved. Sometimes they get heated, they argue. What does the person who's proud want to do in that argument? Win. And not just win, but defeat. And oftentimes, in that argument, your goal is to put the other person down, to judge them. Oftentimes, you're criticizing them. You're assuming they've done things, false assumptions. I can't believe, and you're starting to think how what they were thinking and how what, their intentions, and all of a sudden, whereas the humble person, it's like, yeah, I made a mistake. Or the humble person doesn't notice your mistakes. The humble person is the kind of person that will yeah, I know they're tired. Let me go do the dishes before they ask. The humble person will say, yeah, you know what? They deserve rest. They deserve a break. I, I'm happy to do that. They're, they're the ones that when you're around someone who has self-denial, you love them. Because why? They don't make you feel low. They make you feel good about yourself. They're the ones that are honoring you. They're the ones that are listening to you. They're not cutting you off. They're not doing the talking. I wish I could stop talking, and I will eventually. But they're the ones that, like, I just want to, I need to learn, I need to grow, I need to benefit, and I can learn from anyone. Those people have peace. There are people that will take advantage of them. There's no doubt about it. But in the end, they're the ones that are getting God's grace. And they're the ones that are continuing in this way. There are books and books on humility. The purpose of this talk is not to say this is all you need to know about humility or a spiritual guide or a spiritual rule. This is just things we need to pursue. These are the things that we need to pursue. And when we are having self-denial... We will become the servants of all. And this is, what is our goal again? Union with Christ and imitation of Christ. If you open Philippians 2, what does it say? Philippians 2, chapter, sorry, chapter 2, verses 3 to 8. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others higher than himself. That is self-denial. Let each of you look out not for his own interests, but also the interests of others. That's self-denial. He says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Saying, follow Christ's example. Who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, which is humble enough, he humbled himself again and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. This is one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. And what are we supposed to do? Follow Christ's example. Christ wasn't defending himself. He wasn't cursing others. He wasn't chastising. He wasn't judging. He was accepting and leading us all to heaven. Self-denial is one of the most beautiful qualities and humility. And if we pursue that, you will grow. That characterizes all our prayers. People say, why do we say, Lord, have mercy? I'm like, did you stop needing mercy? I, I haven't. So I'm going to keep saying it. So, this path that I'm talking about, I've only spoken about three of the ten things that I wrote down. It's just the beginning of the path that has been proven by thousands of individuals for thousands of years who have reached the highest levels. I'm saying... Here's the path. 
let's go on it. Let's seek it, let's pursue it, let's follow it. So this week, I really would like you to pray for a spiritual guide that you are comfortable with, sharing with an experienced person. If you want to grow closer to Christ, that's only if you want to grow closer to Christ. If you don't, then forget it. But if you do, pray that God sends you this person. It's the most critical thing for you to begin and to continue and to grow. There's a lot more to speak about next week, so hopefully you'll come back. Don't be so humble like I'm not worthy to go to the meeting. Please, (laughs) come next week. Let's stand and pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. My dear Lord Jesus Christ, who is God and humbled himself, made himself of no reputation so that you might be among us and that you might lift us up. It was the greatest example. It's what draws us to love you so much. It's what makes us want to bow down to you and honor you and glorify you. I thank you, dear Lord, that you paved the way. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will lead us into your kingdom. I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to fight with our egos. Dear Lord, I know it's not easy and sometimes we may need you to break our egos. I pray, dear Lord, that you help us to accept humbling. Help us, O Lord, to continue in humility. I pray, dear Lord, that you would pour your grace upon us in abundance. Help us, O Lord, to lift each other up. And we will find that in this, we will be lifted up as a result by you and by each other. Help us, O Lord, to to follow the path, dear Lord, into your kingdom. Help us, O Lord, to stop having so many valleys in our spiritual lives and so many years of standstill. Dear Lord, I know that you look at us sometimes playing in the mud and you say, if only they would listen they could grow and they could become something. Help us, O Lord, to humble ourselves and be willing to follow. I thank you for this group whose hearts are open to you. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give them the seeds that they need in order to produce fruit 30, 60, and 100-fold for the glory of your kingdom and your holy name. We love you, dear Lord, and we want to show you. We just don't know how. So send us leaders, send us guides who have gone on the path and will take us with them. We ask for your great mercy and your great forgiveness. Uh, We need you so much. We rely on you and your grace. Hear us when we, your children, your humble children, cry unto you as our wonderful Father in heaven. We look up unto you, we lift our hearts to you, and we say with one voice, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one through Christ Jesus our Lord. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.